Hello and welcome to our fourth iteration of the digital discussion series organized by the Estonia Briefing Center. Uh, my name is Florian Marcus. I'm a digital transformation advisor uh, here in the beautiful Estonian capital of Tallinn. And today we want to focus on a very particularly important topic. We've talked about e-health, about e-education and many other things. Uh, but what we have not talked about so far in focus and in detail is the electronic identity. Um, we will talk about many different things today. We will answer many different questions. Uh, chief among them, number one, what is an electronic identity? And number two, what's it for? Number three, how can I get one? Uh, and many more things as well. We will have five very distinguished speakers today, uh, two from the government sector and three from uh, the private sector, the companies that have helped create and implement these solutions, uh, both in Estonia and abroad in the wider world. Uh, but before we do that, I would like to make you aware of the conference environment that we're using that you are seeing this stream through right now. It is called WorksUp, and there are many different options uh, that you can take a look at. First of all, you see a general agenda, uh, the different speakers, the different topics, and so on. And next to each uh, speaker, you will see a, a range of buttons. Number one, if you click on details, uh, you will see a more concrete description of the talk uh, that you are about to see. Uh, and then when you click on Q and and A, uh, you can also see, uh, you can also submit your own questions to the speaker that we will deal with live on stage. You can also upvote other people's questions. Uh, when you click on the taskbar, uh, we have a question for you, the audience. Uh, you see that uh, there the question is, how would you describe the state of EID availability in your country? Uh, number one, uh, it is there and it really works. Number two, we have the options, but they don't really seem to work. And uh, number three, uh, we do have these options, but there are no real services connected and thus there is no uptake. Uh, now, last but not least, there is also a profile button on the bottom right corner where we very much invite you to uh, maybe update an Im uh, upload an image, but also uh, share with us your name, your occupation and your organization so that we can find cooperation partners for you uh, that may, may want to approach you uh, so that you can cooperate in the future in your country as well well. But uh, without any further ado, um, I would like to turn your attention to our very first speaker. Uh, her name is Annette Numa. Uh, she is a fellow digital transformation advisor uh, at the Estonia Briefing Center. She's my lovely colleague. And she will tell you more about how electronic identity works in Estonia um, and what kinds of services can be connected to the EID if it is implemented well. Let's take a look. In Estonia, each person receives a unique, unchangeable 11-digit personal identification number from the government. Identification numbers represent individuals in both the physical and electronic realm. Primary electronic identity comes with the physical ID card, which is a mandatory identification document in Estonia. Other eID carriers like the Mobile ID and Digi ID cards are issued in addition to the ID card. The technical concept requires a person's sole control over the eID means. It uses a PKI solution where a private key is generated and stored on the chip of the physical card. Keys for signing or authentication are protected with respective PIN codes. Estonia's eID is used for electronic identification, electronic signing and the secure transfer of sensitive data. eID allows one to securely use a wide variety of state and private sector e-services while being time and cost efficient. Have you ever wondered how did Estonia manage to get 98% of people securely declaring taxes online by the year of 2020? Or made it possible to vote online turning our parliamentary or local elections or even European Parliament elections? Or why so many of your friends have been registering their business to Estonia? Well, the answer for that is actually pretty simple. We implemented a secure digital identity since the year of 2002. Today, 98% of our population have an electronic ID card. However, 
This all happened already 20 years ago. How did the process and the government, how did they manage to boost this through so long time ago? And what were the biggest highlights from the decision-making part? You're going to hear about this today, and also you're going to walk with me through some of my own memories and highlights of using the advantages of a very secure digital identity. My name is Annette Numa, and I work as a digital transformation advisor at the Estonia Briefing Center. Today, every Estonian has a state-issued digital identity. How did the process start? Well, we have to jump back to the historical background. In the year of 1999, the electronic ID card was already introduced in our lovely neighborhood country called Finland. The Estonian government and, of course, also our parliament had their full attention uh, on, on this entire process of implementation and tried to learn from the, our Finnish friends. There was one very essential thing that got our attention. Finland had decided to keep this card as a known compulsory card, but when we were focusing on the numbers of people that were issued the card, that was pretty small. And that made us very concerned and wonder whether we should do this differently and legally make this card compulsory to absolutely everyone. That's what we did. And by the numbers today, around 46% uh, 40 per uh, of Finnish people have this card, identity card, and in Estonia the number, as I brought it out before, remains at 98. So that says a lot of things. The first Estonian ID card was issued already in January 2002, and the amount of people using the ID card, mobile ID, smart ID solutions, has been increasing every single year, and especially turning the time when the pandemic hit the world. Estonian Parliament passed already a Digital Signature Act in March 2000, and it entered into the force by the end of 2000. And by giving also people a chance to sign documents hopefully online with these solutions, every single year our citizens save approximately five days per year. And when we talk about the cost by the government aspect, so the government is able to save around 2% of GDP every single year, by providing our citizens a chance to also sign documents fully online. This number, 2% of GDP, is equal to the money we spend on defense and security sector to be a loyal member of NATO. And I think this is pretty great, right? To move on here, let's take a look on our ID card. How does it look and what kind of information do we have on a card? First of all, our ID card holds um, the name of the cardholder, a personal code. Then we also have the birth uh, time, sex, cardholder citizenships, and of course also card number would also when would be your expiry date as well. In addition to that, the car contains two certificates and they're associated with the private keys protected with PIN codes. Why I wanted to bring it out, and, and especially what kind of information do we have on a card, is that Estonia has followed the rule called uh, less is more. Many countries have decided to do this in a complete different way and have a lot of information of their citizens based on this ID card. First of all, they have your eye color, also information how tall you are, and sometimes also even, in, even information where exactly do you live, what's your apartment number. My question to you who are listening today, would you feel safe having that much information on your card, especially home address? Even more, every single time you move to a new place and, and change your home address, you would need to get the new card or get the sticker on your card. Not very convenient, right? So we have decided to do that in a way that less is 100% much more. To move over here now, I have a tiny question to you, our audience right now. What's common about these features, these locations. Of course, you can think about, that's fantastic. There are um, wonderful palm trees, and it seems to be super sunny there. But why I wanted to show you these photos was because these photos have been taken exactly after one minute after when I had been participating in Estonian elections. And if you're wondering, if on the first photo, which is done in, uh, which is taken in, in, in the Paradise Island of Maldives, that there was an Estonian embassy or a polling station, then of course, no. Or the second one, in my favorite city, Paris. No, there was no polling station, not the embassy. I was just able to open my laptop and use my electronic identity, and I was able to vote online fully by using this solution. 
But what else can we do with this identity card or smart ID, mobile ID solutions? There are plenty of things. First of all, uh, we can sign documents online, and I also have one very great um, highlight or, or just a memory that I wanted to share with you. Um, so I was traveling in Barcelona by the time when I got um, accepted to the university, and they kindly asked me to send back the document with uh, my digital signature um, just in, uh, in, in one day. I was supposed to come back to Estonia after one and a half weeks. Of course, I didn't have to go there, find any kind of scanners and, and write my signature on paper. I was just able with, with just half a minute to sign my documents online and send it back to my university while being in Barcelona. Or also accessing all of our banking services, which is also possible fully online. And our banking sector has been a big help by providing us also um, the ID card readers. And if you would now take a moment after my presentation to go and check your wallet, and it would count us how many different loyalty cards do you have there? I can tell you that I only have one single loyalty card, and this is my identity card. Yes, I don't need to have tons of different cards in my wallet because I can also use, in order to provide my loyalty to the different uh, private sector companies, shops and so on, by just using one single card. And then, of course, also I can get access to all of my medicals by using this card even without having to make any physical visits to my doctor. I can call my doctor, they will write me a prescription, and in a couple of minutes I can just walk to the pharmacy and get access to my medicals. Or even I can order these medicals to home location, which is fantastic too. And even more wonderful, there are already a couple of countries such as Finland that I can travel to and I can get access to my prescriptions which are issued by the Estonian doctor by using my Estonian card in Helsinki in pharmacy there. So this is where we are moving with, with uh, having, having these solutions. And of course, also when the police would stop me in a way when I'm driving, I would like to check if my driving license uh, has not expired. So um, they can also just type in my identity code to the system or check my uh, ID card and, and I can prove also that I'm um, able to travel and I have this valid driving license in a way as well. So there are many, many things that we can use this card for and, and I have been really much also um, you, I, I would say, like using the advantages of, uh, of uh, using this ID card as well. But um, with the last slide that I wanted to bring it out here was some of the lessons and I want to share with you because I know that there are so many people that are listening to us, especially from the private sector, from different governments. First of all, if you're going to make these decisions and starting to implement the ID card, I'm, I'm asking kindly to keep everything very transparent because people are going, to, uh, are going to trust you much, much more if you are doing this in a very transparent way so that they can understand how things work. Then, of course, also try to organize as many different campaigns as possible to raise people's awareness and the knowledge how to use the systems is because this remains very, very, very important. And I'm never getting tired of saying that, but continue doing things together with the private sector because they know much better how to do these things and they can support you also financially. Well, like the ex example from the banking sector that I brought it out before, that they helped us to also get access to the uh, ID card readers for free, which was great as well. But one thing that is still very essential is that the way you communicate these changes in your state. If you just say to your citizens, to your voters, that this is how we're going to do things, our government has made a decision that ID card is going to be compulsory, you need to get this card now. That's the wrong way to do that. Please do start in a way that you're saying, well, these are the advantages that you can start using if you would get the card. And I do hope that my presentation today gave you a little bit of inspiration why this card is so beneficial and what kind of advantages do we have with this. And of course, less is always more. So try to keep everything very, very short and simple. And I would end up with, um, a, with the dot here that I think it's pretty clear already that digital identity will be the most valuable attribute for each citizen in the future and even today already. And it's each government responsibility to make sure that safety has been provided in all possible layers. We have realized this in Estonia already many, many years ago. 
and I'm kindly suggesting all of you to focus on this as soon as possible. Hopefully, you're going to get some more inspiration from the next presenters in our digital discussion today. So I would like to say thank you for you uh, for listening, and I wish all of you would stay healthy and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Well, uh, Annette, uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us today, and thanks for this overview of uh, what has been done in Estonia over the last uh, two decades, actually. Uh, so quite, quite a bit of time already. Uh, we've got several questions from the audience, but first, a small reminder to you, uh, dear audience members, uh, that you can still uh, vote on the, the uh, task section. Uh, you can still reply uh, to our question um, about the availability of electronic ID in your country. Uh, we will deal with the result of that poll uh, after the next presentation. Uh, but uh, for now, I want to uh, focus with you on some of the questions that the audience has asked. Uh, the one with the most upvotes is, what are the biggest hurdles for EID implementation in other countries? What would you say? Um, well, if I, would, if I would think about this way, so I think still again, we have to think about the transparency part and, and providing this great infrastructure side. Um, I, I think this has been a very big lesson to Estonia, especially because that you need to create this kind of very secure infrastructure that it will be supported in so many ways. And, and, and definitely, as I said in my presentation many times, that uh, when, we, when we see disadvantages and, and people getting much more time uh, in, in order to do other things in a way, so, so we have benefited a lot from, uh, by, by having this card. And um, yeah, I mean, still like you, you always need to be also um, up to date with your technology in a way because uh, of course when we even think about the implementation process in Estonia our ID card infrastructure has changed a lot in time uh, so we, we have tried to do that more and more secure and, and, and using new technologies uh, as well here. Uh, and surely, I mean, we, we see that the, the situation is very different from country to country. Uh, the, the degree of political mm -hmm. will, the support mm -hmm. in general, um, is usually a bigger factor than perhaps financing because digitalization is not as expensive as people usually make it mm -hmm. out to be, I would say. Um, uh, another question is, would you say it's possible to build an e-state without an EID? Um, I don't think <coughs> so. Uh, I mean... It will be possible to provide people services, but is it safe? Do they feel safe by providing their own information? Um, well, I don't think so. So I would, um, I would say if I would just compare, as I said, we implemented this in the year of 2002. We started with a physical ID card. Uh, I don't see that it will be necessary for each country to start with a physical card anymore, but you can still implement smart ID, mobile ID solutions. So there are many, many different methods, but everyone need to have e-identity in a way. It doesn't mean a card itself, but it, it does not mean that it has to be a way either you have a personal good or just a very secure way. So Some we, sort of universal exactly. identifier. Exactly. You can't yeah. just have like, I don't know, a username and a random password that you just create yourself and you need to update once in a while. It has to be provided by the state. So um, so I would say, yes, it's, it's important. I think the issue is also that, of course, today we already have EIDs. It's mm -hmm. just that we have separate EIDs for every mm -hmm. single portal, mm -hmm. for every single mm -hmm. website, um, even if they are all secure, um, odds are that you will not have a different email address and a different password for every single mm -hmm. account that you have online. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you just made it less secure mm -hmm. uh, again. Um, when was the last time you gave a real signature? <laughs> um, actually it happened um, one and a half years ago. Um, because one and a half years ago, still we needed to, when we wanted to buy uh, a new property, so an apartment, we needed to go to notary and sign the documents mm -hmm. on, on paper. I'm, I'm happy to tell you that we don't have to do this anymore, because uh, by the time of the crisis, this changed, and, and now we can also buy properties fully online by digital signature. Uh, but it was the last time that I needed to do that. It was very weird for me, because I, um, I was in the notary office, and, and they asked me to sign a document on paper, and I was like, well, I have to like remind myself, how does it look like? Uh, it was weird, but I'm so happy to see right now that, that we can do these things also uh, remotely now. Uh, for, for me also, I mean, being German, I came to Estonia five and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the first time I had to do a digital signature, I was very overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Like, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. How does it work? Uh, but um, yeah, if I would now think about what is my signature, what does it mm -hmm. look like? 
I'm not quite sure I could do it exactly as it was before. Exactly. Um, there were many more good questions, but sadly, this is all we have time for right now. So, Annette, thank you so much uh, you. For, for being with us. A kind reminder to the audience, uh, please do uh, fill out the, uh, the question under tasks uh, and share your thoughts with us uh, through there. Um, in the meantime, I would like to uh, move on to the next speaker. Her name is Ruth Anus. Uh, she is the Director General of Citizenship and Migration Policy, working for the Department at the Ministry uh, of uh, Interior. And she will tell us more uh, about secure identity management as the key to an e-society. Let's take a look. Uh, Hello, uh, dear guests, partners. I'm glad to share some thoughts about our experience uh, of creating fully digital society. Mm, I've been working for Estonian government uh, for more than 20 years, and uh, through these two decades, I have seen the rise and shine of Estonian e-society, working closely on the legislative frame, developing e-residency, startup visa program, and digital nomad visa program. So, by now, we have proved that this society is convenient and also provides resilience in crisis. When we started uh, our e-government in uh, 2001, uh, we actually uh, created an x road, which is a secure layer for data exchange. Uh, and then, in 2002, uh, we created e-government. And then, of course, it's, uh, it was already very easy to come out with new ideas. And uh, we launched e-residency 2014, startup visa in 2017. And last year, we uh, came out with digital nomad visa. And uh, what do we really think that it's uh, uh, the government's responsibility to provide secure identity management tools uh, for people. Uh, the key issue communicating with each other in the internet is how to be sure that uh, the person is who he or she claims to be. Uh, so there are all sorts of identity tokens available, but we believe that uh, it's really the government's task to provide secure identity management. And based on that, uh, you can have nice uh, programs for other people as well. So, um, when a state issues a, a document confirming person's identity, then the state takes responsibility for the right identification of the person. And person's name, a unique identification code, uh, and um, biometrics are tied uh, together so that the person will have a legal identity. And uh, it's a very good tool to avoid uh, several identities, identity thefts, uh, and using false identity, which are the main problems, of course, in the world. Uh, and our people really love our e-government and our e-society, uh, because according to our experience, e-government is based on trust and it not has to just has to be secure and trustworthy, but it also has to seem and uh, secure and trustworthy to people. And our people, as I said, love our e-society out of the population uh, of 1.3 million, uh, like uh, 99% uh, of population holds a val valid uh, DGID. And basically, we trust e-voting at parliament and local government elections. Uh, in parliament elections 2019, when we had um, the percentage of already 44 of uh, people who used e-voting. And we have uh, our lovely e-residents um, more than uh, 78,000 already, and they come from more than uh, 170 countries. And uh, to be honest, uh, e-residency is uh, quite profitable as well, because all these uh, people 
um, have created more than uh, 16,000 companies. So it's, uh, we are glad to share our e-society uh, with them. And uh, as mentioned, startup visa, maybe it could be combined with e-residency. Uh, the, the same uh, about uh, the digital nomad visa, but uh, it will be uh, most probably next year, not this year. So basically, when we uh, were living nicely our uh, very convenient digital uh, lifestyle, then something happened that uh, we really could have imagined only in the darkest uh, scenarios. We suddenly found ourselves in the middle of the ID crisis that affected uh, more than two-thirds of our population. So it appeared that the chip we used was with a flaw, and the nature of the risk was that the private key could be computed out of uh, the public key which means that it was possible to steal a digital identity without having the physical uh, card present. Of course, uh, we immediately took technical uh, uh, countermeasures. Uh, more than uh, 740,000 uh, EIDs were suspended. And uh, by the 1st of April, uh, the cards not renewed uh, were uh, finally revoked. So, but the main tool we had was trust, because e-Estonia is based on trust. Uh, immediately when we um, found out that the risk might be uh, real, we uh, became public. Our prime minister uh, went public and said that we have a real problem. But the trust is the main uh, issue that really helps to have a fully digital society. So, <clears throat> when we had our EID uh, crisis, uh, it really it became very clear that transparency, openness and uh, honesty is the one uh, that uh, helps us uh, going. So the ID crisis in 2017 shook our uh, fully digital society a lot, but we learned a lot uh, of it as well. So basically, we learned that um, EID card is more important than we knew. So um, actually, we were not the only ones uh, who used the chip. Basically, uh, 1.3 billion chips and ID cards of more than 10 states were revoked. Uh, and uh, I would say no one even noticed, because they don't have a fully digital society. So, it was not uh, that important to other states, but our society uh, was in a crisis. Then uh, have uh, the other uh, lesson we learned is have alternatives. Fortunately, we had our mobile ID, uh, and that is as good as uh, EID card since 2011. And partly we, we could switch to that. Uh, map and update cross dependencies of critical services. Have plan A, plan B, and plan C at, at least. And the uh, pool of experts is limited, uh, duplicate if possible. And we, we were very glad to find out uh, that the backup of experts working for the government are experts working in the private sector. Then, no one wants to go back to the paper, even if they could. People cured for hours to have a new ID card. And uh, certified does not mean secure. We definitely used uh, a chip on our ID card uh, uh, that was uh, certified and provided by a respectable international company. But uh, in 2014, when the chip was certified, there was no technology to discover that uh, uh, the floor was there. 
And uh, last but not least, uh, this will not be th the last of such uh, incidents. So be prepared. And we found out that the mm, uh, trust was there because in the middle of the ID crisis, we uh, had our local government elections and almost 32% uh, of people used e-voting. So obviously current pandemic has become an accelerator of creating understanding why people across uh, the world need and deserve a secure digital identity. And uh, this is uh, what uh, we definitely are very glad to share our experience. Other countries are, countries are also uh, working on e-residency. Uh, then uh, US has used uh, Estonian election tools as uh, an example uh, to be used. Then of course we had Brexit. And we have Estonian fan club across the borders. These are our e-residents. So, in conclusion, it is most important to invest in secure te technology, but it is as important as that to invest in transparency and trust. And in case the secure digital relationships between people themselves and between the state and the person are reliable, e-society can be established. And you are most welcome to contact us and we gladly share our experience developing the first fully digital society. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Ruth, uh, for, for that very good insight into um, how, how the EID has been used uh, in, in different sectors and also how it has sparked developments like uh, e-residency, uh, among other things. Um, we've got plenty of questions from the audience, but first I would like to take a look at the results of our first uh, poll that we put forward to you, the audience. And we can see, so how would you describe the state of EID availability uh, in your particular country, uh, we can see that um, some, well, actually, is quite a big split between uh, we have EID options in our country and they really work, and we have them, but there are no connected services uh, to them, and thus there is not a lot of uptake. I think this is actually quite a... Um, a symptomatic overview of the world. So we, we see that more and more developments have been made in countries around the world, but uh, that we're still waiting for the service implementation in most countries. Would you agree with that assessment? Uh, yeah, I definitely uh, agree with that because you have to have the whole ecosystem in place mm. uh, to have a fully digital society. If you have a very, very secure digital identity card and no services, it would be just a waste of money. And uh, when you have services, uh, but you don't have a secure token to use it, so it won't work. It has to be the whole ecosystem. You won't have very, uh, very high usage rates if you don't have an electronic ID, that's for sure. Uh, we've got many, many questions, and I can already apologize right now. We will not have time to, to deal with all of them. Um, the first one actually goes very much into, into your ex area of expertise. How do you handle asylum seekers when an identity has not been confirmed? Do they also get an EID? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing also about the refugee crisis. How did that affect Estonia back then? Uh, yes, we provide everyone a secure uh, EID. Basically, what we do is uh, if a person doesn't have any documents, uh, we take the name the person says to us, and uh, then we provide a secure you know, uh, identity code, uh, which is a unique one, and we tie that identity to the uh, person's biometrics. Mm -hmm. So we really don't know whether the person is really the one he uh, or she claims to be, but at least from that point of view, Estonian government uh, uh, knows that person by that name because uh, with secure uh, uh, biometrics, uh, the person can have just one identity. And you have to make a start somewhere, right? Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah. So if you, if you have no previous information, then uh, electronic ID itself does not help you solve the problems of the past uh, in, in that case. 
Um, does Estonia have a plan to implement remote onboarding to get electronic ID cards or electronic identities without physically visiting a state authority? I'm guessing this is primarily a question uh, for foreigners and maybe EU residents as well. I think I know your answer. <laughs> <coughs> uh, yes, uh, we are tied to our EIDAS regulation. Mm -hmm which means that at some point a person has to be uh, physically identified. Uh, but we are considering uh, that um, all sorts of options. And definitely, uh, if something like that uh, would, yeah, would happen, then most probably it would be the second document. Yeah. It's not the first document. First, to establish the identity of the person, and then from that uh, way on, uh, we can maybe have some shortcuts. The digital access, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, I'll answer this next question uh, just very shortly myself. What are the procedures to establish a company without a physical visit to Estonia? Number one, get an e-residency card. You do have to show up once to the next pickup point. Usually in embassy, there are exceptions. Um, and then you just go to the state portal and you do it. It takes around 20 to 30 minutes. Um, you need a, a, a European Union bank account, not even an Estonian bank account anymore. Uh, so that uh, goes quite quickly as well. Now, here's another question uh, that forces us to look uh, beyond Estonia. Um, and I'm sure that you've, you've been aware of these developments as well. Switzerland just voted last weekend against a Swiss EID. The main reason being not trusting private companies to run it, even though it would be controlled by the government. Uh, so trust seems to be paramount in Switzerland. What was your experience in Estonia in that aspect? How did you treat that topic? Uh, well, um, as I said, Estonia, uh, e-government is based on trust. So... Uh, the government was the one who established uh, the X road uh, to uh, have uh, data exchange between uh, information systems. And uh, the other part is, is that I think Estonia is so small mm. that everyone knows everyone. So it's very easy to trust the government. And uh, when we, um, you know, of course, it's uh, up to procurement uh, and uh, it would be not the wisest thing, I would say, that we would have a huge production line and pro, uh, producing the ID cards. Mm. We take care that the data on the chip and on the card is the one that it is supposed to be. Uh, so uh, it can be checked uh, by the person who has looked at the data, but uh, just the real production mm. of, uh, of ID cards. Happens uh, elsewhere. Yeah. 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 Um, I, sh I should also add that, yes, in Estonia, of course, um, it, it happened comparable to what was proposed in Switzerland. The government commissioned a solution, mm -hmm. uh, the private sector provided the solution, and then the government takes it over for operation uh, at the end of the day. Um, so I, I think that this system can work overall, but of course the government needs to make sure that there are no back doors, that you know, all the security checks are made uh, so that the government really is in control when the solution is handed back uh, to, to the public sector. Um, I don't know about all of the different details of the, of the Swiss um, uh, solution that was proposed during the referendum, uh, but it sounded to me like, uh, like the companies would have a bit more say in how the solutions are developed. But uh, leave, leave that in the comments and uh, send us an email to the briefing center. We love talking about these questions as well. Um, another question is, how does Estonia feel about using biometrics instead of PIN codes for its EID carriers? Let's say Smart ID, you have the app, you just put your fingerprint or something. I have a very strong opinion on this. I think you do too. <laughs> yes, uh, definitely. Um, you know, to have a secure uh, identity, digital identity, uh, so that people could trust it, uh, the whole process has to be controlled by the government. We don't know uh, what, is, uh, what devices people will use uh, at home. So maybe someday, but, uh, but to have a real secure identity, to make sure that the person really is the one uh, with the government uh, identity behind that computer or behind that phone, mm. Mm, it's, uh, we are not there yet. It should be something in your head rather than something on your body that somebody could take away theoretically uh, quite quite easily. Yeah, the best one would be that you have three com components. Yes. Something yeah. what you have physically, uh, something uh, what you know, your, mm -hmm. your codes, and uh, something what you are 
biometrics that would yeah. be the best solution. But of course, uh, we can combine these things. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ruth, thank you so much. It's been fascinating to talk to you. And also thank you, uh, dear audience members, uh, for all the questions. Uh, before we're heading over to our next uh, presentation, I would like to introduce to you the next task on your list, uh, the next poll that we would like to ask you, uh, namely, what kind of EID carrier would you prefer using? Uh, a card-based electronic ID? I would use something on a mobile phone, or I would prefer a third-party login option. Uh, in Estonia's history, we've had all three, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing your answers as well. Uh, but without any further ado, we're moving on to our next speaker. His name is Georg Nikolaevsky, and he's the business development executive at SKID Solutions. He will tell us uh, what smart ID is uh, and how it can help create the, uh, the problem or how, how it can help solve the problem of cross-border trusted identity. Let's take a look. Good morning. My name is Georg Nikolaevsky, and I represent today SKID Solutions, a qualified trust service provider located in Estonia. I'm very excited to be invited to participate in digital discussions. And in my presentation today, I will cover successfully deployed a new generation cross-border electronic identity solutions we launched in the Baltic countries with the examples on the major Baltic banks. But first of all, let us look at the global trends that are driving the market. First, of course, is the digitalization of businesses, the services, which is now more accelerated due to the global pandemic situation. Nowadays, users expect simple, convenient experiences. Therefore, the usability is the key importance for them. Growing popularity of the mobile devices puts the mobile at first on a very important position. And we, ha we also have to remember that the fraud is also growing. The fraudsters have been exploiting the weaknesses of the poor password protected systems in online services. Different biometrical techniques are on a rise worldwide and becoming more affordable to leverage. The market is driven by the banking because in this segment, the majority of transactions are happening. And it is very important, especially for the banks, to protect the customer with secure and convenient solutions. So if I briefly talk about our activities. So our company has been providing electronic identity service for the public and the private sector for 20 years. Decades of experience, our leading experts, research, technology, all that together bring us to provide efficient and affordable solutions to the nations in the, in the world. And by taking advantage of that experience and also considering the growth of the mobile trend, we brought in 2017 to the market the new generation mobile application-based electronic identity called Smart ID. With Smart ID, you don't need any special SIM cards. You don't need any additional hardware or you don't need even the card readers. And, and the most important is that we even removed the borders, of course, inside the European Union. So what is Smart ID? Smart ID is a personal identification solution for authenticating and providing electronic signatures. 
we created fast and convenient solution that can be used on different devices, so users are not limited only to one device. In case if something happens, you can always use your second identity. It is providing high level of security and advanced cryptography and proven public key infrastructure enables that your services are secured. It was very important uh, to address uh, European Union, so therefore the cross-country usage was brought in that, uh, in that solution to the importance. And of course, when you're dealing with electronic transactions, it is always important that you're uh, leaving a legally binding trace. So therefore, with a smart ID, you are able to provide qualified electronic signatures, which are equal to the handwritten one. And of course, to create transparency and the trust in cross-border transactions, smart ID is compliant to the ADAS, GDPR, and uh, payment service directive, which is important in the financial sector. I already mentioned that the uh, interface is quite simple, seamless, and intuitive. So for the users, it's very, it's very easy and quickly to navigate using, uh, using the menu. Also, in case of addressing uh, the frauds, we, we introduced the different ways how we could uh, help them fighting uh, these cases. We have implemented uh, several ways, and one of these is uh, to bring the awareness of the user of, of his action. So, for example, if he's trying to log into the service or trying to make a payment, he will see the confirmation asking him, like, are you sure that this is what you want to do? Another additional new security feature is a three-code solution. The three-code solution uh, provides e-service providers with, uh, with additional third layer of protection in addition to the authentication and digital signature. So where user can select the right PIN code, and if the code is not selected, then the transaction cannot be completed. A couple of weeks before the global pandemic, SK introduced new biometry and AI-based onboarding method for the smart ID. During the state of emergency, in the last spring, when people movements were restricted, Smart ID new identification method was the only way for them to conduct necessary activities online. I also put uh, the link below where you can quickly check how simple and quick this method is. But actually it is. All you need is your governmentally approved document supporting the biometry, your mobile device and yourself, and this is it. So what we achieved so far? With operating a little bit over three years with the Smart ID, we covered nearly three million people in the Baltic countries who are making actually more than 65 million transactions every month. And it was quite important also to address the foreign people living here in the Baltic countries. And we already have 34 countries supported in, uh, in our solution. We are also quite proud that on a daily basis, we have one million active users who are conducting the transactions in different e-services. So now let's quickly jump and look what is happening in the financial world. So on the use cases with the banks, the forcing factors was the rapidly changing the regulation. And uh, the banks has to also modify and change the services. So for example, from the 2017 April, uh, it was notified that um, the code cards were not a secure element anymore, and the bank has to find the new alternative and provide more strong customer authentication solutions. After integrating our service, one of the banks indicated that uh, simplicity was quite important for them, uh, and uh, that actually boosted the growth of the mobile uh, experience of the users. So basically, every second person in the bank started more actively using uh, and accessing the critical for them service. It also allowed them to use uh, the service cross countries, so because in the Baltics, uh, financial institutions are operating across the countries. So it was very important to bring that possibility to them. And in, in, and in general, more than 75% of the users who started to use the new identity solution started more frequently, nearly four times more, addressing the services online. 
This is one of the examples how, for example, users can be motivated. Because Smart ID is free of charge for the end users, it is very convenient to see that comparing to another methods, you can take it uh, into the use with, uh, with the easy benefit. With the, with the case of another bank, it was very important to bring again the awareness of the user. So what you see is what you sign, is the ability of the customer to verify their actions on uh, uh, independent device. And this is something that we also were able to introduce. And again, after implementing the services, more than half of, uh, of the transactions were increased and in the usage of online services. So in overall, what you can see here is the summary uh, of the growth after a couple of weeks from the launch of the service in all three countries. So that growth shows us uh, that uh, there was a really high need of secure authentication solution on the market. And this is why this growth was boosted so much. By the end of the first year, uh, the service achieved uh, over 600,000 users. And nowadays, every second person in the Baltic countries is using Smart ID solution. So what we are able to provide? So we are able to provide Smart ID as it is. So you can just simply take it as a service and it can be used in all European space. Also, we can provide you the different combinations like uh, license-based product or the white-labeled product or any other possible combination which uh, your uh, use case can come up with. So to summarize, I would like to say that if you are selecting our services, so you are staying with secure, innovative, fast, convenient, and international services. And with that, I would like to end up my presentation. Thank you, and please join us in the breakout room where you can find out more details about biometrical identification or how the security, is protect, uh, security of the solution is provided, how the, uh, the control of the users are provided in uh, in the Smart ID application. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Georg, uh, for, for this presentation, for, for the facts and figures that you provided us with, not just for Estonia, but also for, for other countries. Um, before we talk about the questions, there are many for you. Uh, I will take a look at the uh, most recent task, the poll that the audience members uh, filled out. The question was, what kind of EID carrier would you prefer using? And we should get uh, the results on the screen in a second. Ah, yes, and there we see it. So um, we see quite a, quite a strong uh, preference for either a card-based EID uh, or, and that's the most, most chosen option, uh, um, something on a mobile phone. Uh, very few people in favor of third-party login options. Um, do you feel like that's, uh, um, that's your experience with, with other countries around the world as well, that they want something more state-provided than a private sector-provided uh, solution, or what do you think? Uh, yes, we actually do see that uh, happening in in many countries that uh, state and the private sector are operating separately and mm -hmm. uh, quite often they are bringing uh, their own solution to the market. So, so this is why I I Estonia is quite a unique where you have a very great co cooperation between public and the private sector. Yeah. Yeah, this fragmentation doesn't really need to happen. Um, sometimes in some countries we also see, uh, for example, in Sweden, I believe it's called Bank ID, provided by the private sector, and the government sector has sort of taken it on board for their own uh, login solutions. So there are different ways of handling, uh, handling this, t this topic, this challenge, uh, but yes. I think Estonia has quite, a, quite an interesting combination. Uh, let's delve right into the questions. Uh, the first one, I believe I know the answer to, uh, but I'll ask you anyway, is smart Smart ID software open source? There's nothing wrong with saying no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, um, it's not an open source. Mm -hmm. uh, we can, if, if you're interested, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, the product can be provided as a license, so you can uh, integrate. That means that you will have your, you will have the access to the source code, and you can uh, create your uh, your own application and solution. 
And I think actually you mentioned the, the white label opportunity as well. So yeah, different countries can make this service what they need it to be. Not every single country has the exact same requirements, both legal and technological. Yes. Uh, so to have this flexibility, uh, or in order to be flexible like that, you don't need it to be open source necessarily. So there's nothing, nothing wrong with that in my opinion. Uh, another very uh, highly upvoted question is, can other countries beyond the Baltic states join the smart ID quote unquote community? Uh, could other countries join that network of nations basically? Yes, of course. And uh, this is what I uh, really wanted to, uh, to deliver as a, as a message, that mm. uh, our solution is uh, certified for, for the European Union, so any country in the European Union can use it as a service. So it means that with the simple integration uh, and uh, onboarding uh, methods, this can be taken into the use in other countries as well. But uh, that also doesn't mean that it's only for the private sector. So it also can be adopted by the public sector as well. Yeah. So, so if the gov government thinks that uh, this is suitable solution as alternative maybe to the existing one, so yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question was, uh, what industries can Smart ID be used in? Do you only focus on the finance sector? Um, as far as I understand, uh, anything with a login portal could be an applicable um, cooperation partner for you, but maybe you want to expand on that. Uh, yes, so <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, that in the financial sector, we can see that the majority of the transactions are happening. Yeah. And uh, uh, of course, uh, it, can, it can be used in the public services if you want to access your tax reports or, or order some services from the government. Uh, from the telecommunication sector, we, we do see that uh, there is a usage and, and the health sector. So yeah. basically any sector can be used. Uh, now this here is, I guess, um uh, a more f fundamental question also about uh, how do we set up these different kinds of systems. Uh, SKID is a trust service provider. Yes. How do you feel about trustless networks such as blockchain-based systems? Uh, we, are, we, we are using the public key infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is where we based our service. And, uh, and, and that is why we are creating uh, the trust using uh, using that infrastructure. Yeah, I, I also think that uh, when, when we talk about blockchain implementations uh, in governments around the world, I can't think of many examples where a government has chosen a proper public blockchain, but rather a permission blockchain where, again, there are a few stakeholders that hold the different parts. Uh, so it's not, not a real trustless network either. It just relies on several trust providers rather than mm -hmm. one. So um, how, how real the blockchain advantages are in the real world, the way that they would be implemented by uh, the public sector, um, can at least be debated. So, so certainly keep an eye out for that. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, is there another EID solution in Estonia that can cooperate with the Smart ID? From my understanding, uh, Smart ID is one of the carriers uh, that helps you authenticate with your Estonian electronic ID. Uh, would that be a fair description? Um, yeah, yeah j just to explain uh, that, that um, uh, Smart ID is... Uh, let's say, the full electronic identity mm. that can be used uh, independently from, uh, uh, from the existing ones. Mm -hmm. But smart ID is actually derived identity. So we are basing it on, uh, on your physical identity issued by the government. Yeah. Um, what else do we have here? Yes. Aha. Um, so this, I don't know why this question did not deserve any more upvotes, uh, but I will ask it because I think it's a very good question. Uh, which jurisdictions are covered with the chosen qualified trust servers, uh, is, uh, trust service providers issued IDs or a certificate? Like, are there certain um, legal requirements that you have to fulfill to be accepted in a certain territory as a trust service provider, and for which ones? have you been able to serve the population already? Uh, yes, so well, we can provide the service in, uh, in the European Union mm -hmm. because we are in the ADAS, uh, ADAS space. Correct. But uh, of course, there are some uh, local, uh, um, local, let's say, legislations that you also have to uh, deal with. And then sometimes, they, the, uh, let's say, the, the local legislation requires that we do some additional steps. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, lastly, when we, uh, perhaps a question that I, I'm all also wondering, uh, when we talk about the implementation phase itself, how long would you say does it go from, uh, from start to finish, from analyzing the legal framework to implementing a solution in a given country? Uh, if there is someone watching uh, from a, a state or, or a national government uh, saying, I would like to try out Smart ID, what, what framework, uh, what time frame can they expect roughly for the implementation? Well, that pretty much depends what do they have in the country. So, yes, so if, if there is uh, absolutely <clears throat> nothing, then of course they need to establish the, the legal ground base in, yeah. in the country because the technology is there. So if we provide it immediately, so it means that you can still leverage from the security and, and, and the compliance. But, but of course, the, uh, the legislation uh, must be also fixed. Absolutely. Uh, well, Georg, it's been uh, a pleasure to have you here on stage. Thank you so much for all of your insights uh, regarding Smart ID, both in Estonia and uh, around the world. Uh, before we're heading over to our next presentation, I would like to make you aware of your next task. You also have some work to do today, uh, namely the question, have you signed a document using your ID card? Uh, very simple uh, answer options, yes or no. Um, so I, uh, I think I will answer that question on behalf of my uh, German uh, native country, um, but yeah, please tell please tell us about uh, what the current state of affairs is in your country as well. In the meantime, we are heading over to our next speaker. His name is Daniel Gusev. He's the chief sales officer at Best Solutions, and he will tell you more about uh, how to face a digital future with mobile ID, and he will have a country case study ready for us as well. Let's take a look. Hasan Imza, innovative services for your life. Available wherever you are. Hello, I'm Daniel Gusev at uh, Best Solution. I met challenges with solution to develop secure and trusted e-governance in emerging states around the world. In the past 10 years, we have uh, been uh, uh, driven by the mission uh, to demonstrate uh, the transferability of Estonian digital success by supporting digital transformation of Azerbaijan. Uh, today I would like to share some insights that we gained from our experience and introduce some of our solutions that we can help develop in other countries. Uh, we are living in a time of uh, accelerated digitalization. Going digital holds a uh, 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 promise a wide range of uh, uh, economical and social benefits on a national, geographical and global scale. Uh, and, uh, and we see that more and more countries are trying to deliver on that promise. Um, the digital transformation of the state is a long-term commitment with no concrete end date. Uh, and it requires paradigm shift in national leadership and uh, is successful when pursued through a strong public-private partnership. Uh, we at uh, Best Solution have had the chance to walk this path of digitalization in Azerbaijan for the last 10 years. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, extracted lessons from our Estonian experience and carefully tailored our uh, solution for the local market to uh, help develop uh, Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan into its own digital success story. 
Uh, identity is a cornerstone of all interactions between people, state, and businesses. Uh, to pro uh, the person's ability to provide himself in, uh, in a digital world is required by banking, entering key services, and make different kinds of transactions. Uh, Best Solution uh, uh, strongly believe that uh, mobile ID is a future. Not only we have seen that uh, people are going more and more mobile, but mobile ID ticks all the boxes of simplicity, accessibility, security, and scalability. With this, uh, I would like to introduce our mobile ID solution that is called Asan Mzai in Azerbaijan and can be translated as Easy Signature. Uh, from 2015, we have uh, developed uh, and helped to uh, implement mobile ID in Azerbaijan uh, to provide a personal identification uh, solution for accessing e-government solutions. It is uh, provided by the state and offers uh, authentication and digital uh, signature functions. Uh, Asan Imza is secure, trusted, and easy to use. It doesn't require internet connection and works on all devices. Uh, everything that is needed is feature phone or mobile phone and a secure SIM card. Importantly, Asan Mza provides the highest level of assurance. Uh, and digital certificates issued by Asan Mza provides, uh, meets uh, uh, free fact and authentication requirements of, first, something the user have, uh, a mobile ID SIM card that is owned by the user. Second, the uh, something that user is uh, biometrical and face-to-face -face meeting when the mobile ID SIM card is issued. And the third, something the user knows. Uh, mobile ID PIN codes can be generated by the citizen himself and uh, without which the certificates cannot be uh, used. So how does mobile ID works? First, uh, citizens should receive a mobile ID SIM card. Then he chooses a service uh, that he would like to access. Enters his mobile uh, ID, uh, mobile, no, uh, mobile phone number and personal ID. Uh, then he will receive a verification uh, code that he have to compare and enter his uh, mobile ID pin code one for authentication. And the seconds, the generated certificate is sent to mobile operator, then forwarded to certification authority who proves the identity of a person and access to the service is granted. Uh, to make all this possible, the mobile ecosystem uh, uh, includes, first, the registration authority that issues mobile ID. Second, a uh, mobile ID operator that connects all mobile operators, certification authority, and service providers to one ecosystem. Third, the official certification uh, authority that provides full life cycle uh, management of digital uh, certificates. And the last but not least, service providers, starting from banks and government institutes that provide services to business and citizens. Since the implementation in 2015, we have seen growing interest to our mobile ID solution in Azerbaijan. Without going into much details, I would like to share some insights that we have gained for today. Uh, in five years, we uh, have issued more than 1.9 uh, million certificates, and we have uh, more than 4 million transactions uh, per month, and numbers are growing rapidly. Uh, more than 1,000 e-services are connected to our ecosystem. As I mentioned before, uh, mobile ID is a solution that ensures accessibility. It doesn't require internet connection. It works on all devices. Uh, uh, all devices. And, it's, uh, and I would like to briefly introduce some of our solutions that mobile ID helped to develop uh, in Azerbaijan. To ensure digital exclusivity, Asan Mza supported several services based on variable solutions of call centers. These services are especially popular in rural areas where computer literacy is very low. Uh, and uh, particularly very popular is tax declaration. Taxpayer can fill in and declare their taxes by calling a call center without any use of PC or internet. The operator of call center guides uh, the taxpayer through the process. The taxpayer needs only to sign his uh, declaration by using mobile ID pin code 2 for digital signature. 
Uh, our future plans to expand the list of services in the call center and to integrate uh, variable solution to other popular services. Asanemza played a fundamental role in development of uh, digital trade hub of Azerbaijan. It's an e-trade and e-commerce platform that simplifies uh, export and import uh, uh, procedures. Uh, also, Asanemza enabled uh, to launch a mobile uh, M residency program that issues mobile ID to entrepreneurs around the world who would like to uh, start and manage their business uh, in Azerbaijan remotely. Uh, this, uh, this solution and many more are possible all thanks to well-built ecosystem uh, that we integrated in Azerbaijan and uh, any other with a good strategy and uh, a good solution, any other country can do the same. Uh, <clears throat> uh, to wrap up, our key takeaways are following. First, mobile ID, uh, mobile ID works in digital environment like um, uh, physical identification method in the real world, like passport or ID card. It can be used uh, for identification, uh, for entering key services, uh, transactions, or sign digital uh, documents. Second, uh, mobile devices at almost everybody's pocket, the mobile ID is most accessible and uh, affordable uh, solution uh, for a foundation of uh, digital uh, development. Third, the service is always easy to use uh, for end user, regardless of uh, platform that he chooses, internet, SMS, or call center. Mobile ID is secure and uh, it works on uh, proven technology, which issues uh, the highest level of assurance. Uh, based on the experience and solution I have briefly introduced to you, uh, I can confidently say that we, a company who not only knows how to develop successful legal arm solution, but we have proven ourselves in practice. And with this, I would like to, introduce, uh, to invite you to our breakout room, where I'm gladly uh, happy to share some insights on our mobile ID project, uh, answer any questions, and go into more details uh, about uh, how to start uh, implementation of mobile infrastructure, infrastructure in uh, your country. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Daniel, thank you so much for, for that overview and also the, the special focus on, on what you've done in Azerbaijan, uh, how it's been working out over the last few years. So really exciting also, I think, for Estonians in general to see that progress uh, outside of Estonia and also to see that um, the success is not exclusive to Estonia, that you can maybe not copy-paste solutions, but that they can certainly be implemented uh, in other countries as well. Um, before we head to the questions, and there are many, <laughs> that might also give you a good idea for the, for the breakout session, um, I want to look at the uh, task at the poll that we have had uh, prepared for you. Um, have you signed a document using your ID card? And it's almost a 50-50 split. Uh, between yes and no. Now, I'm curious about the national composition of, of that, whether it's mostly Estonians answering or, uh, or maybe some Germans who have uh, paid uh, several euros for a digital signature. Uh, so um, it would be very interesting to see that, and I'm sure we're going to go into more detail regarding this. Um, but uh, going to our Q&A, uh, there are many, many good questions. Uh, the, most, uh, votes were, uh, the most votes were given to the following question. What were the factors that affected the successful implementation of mobile ID in Azerbaijan? So like, what were the key things that had to be ready? Uh, the willingness of government is the most yeah. important. Uh, pretty uh, difficult and successful work on uh, government's uh, legislation. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, uh, willingness of citizens to use the service. You have to have that openness from both sides, really, not exactly. just the, the political elite, but also the people who, who should use the, the services at the end. And I guess in connection with that, we also have the service design aspect. Uh, and uh, if, for example, as you said, the, the tax declaration that you can do via the phone, if that is something that the, the Azerbaijanis uh, appreciate, and you make that accessible to them, then yes, you will see the usage rates uh, skyrocket. Um, how many e-services have been connected with mobile ID in Azerbaijan? Uh, I don't know the exact numbers, that, that, but there are more than 1,000 of services. More than 1,000 services, you've heard it here first. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, 
Uh, if there are no other questions in the breakout room, he can mention every single one of them. <laughs> uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, what services do you provide beyond mobile ID? What, what else does Best Solutions actually do? So as I uh, briefly introduced, the most popular uh, digital trade hub. Mm -hmm. uh, what I usually call it is uh, eBay for companies, yeah. which allows you to find a partner in Azerbaijan uh, to choose the product to do everything digitally, buy uh, things digitally, sign a contract digitally, tax declaration, customs, everything digitally. And uh, what most important, the government gives acknowledge at this company that all these companies are legal and their products exist. Yeah. Uh, call center, as I said, uh, bank transactions are very popular. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, two of the most, uh, three of the most popular one is uh, tax declaration, as I mentioned before, then uh, legal contracts, uh, labor contracts, I mean. Uh, for example, before, uh, before 2018, when implemented this solution uh, to register um, a per, uh, labor contract, it took approximately two days. Mm -hmm. And when uh, tax authority came to check up uh, if uh, all workers have the contracts, uh, the owner could use, is easily said that uh, we have sent these documents by post and it will take two, three days to deliver and then two, three days to accept by government. But right now, after this solution, the registration of uh, work uh, takes approximately 10 15 minutes at least. You can't get out of it anymore. No, yeah. no. and <laughs> nobody can uh, say that uh, uh, this worker just came. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And third one is, of course, uh, custom declaration. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially for non-EU countries, quite relevant. Yes. Uh, yes, very, very true. Um, how long does the development process take for mobile ID? Can you give us a rough time frame? Uh, let's say if the development on site already after implementing and discussing all legal issues and mm -hmm. uh, uh, legislation, uh, we launched a mobile ID in Azerbaijan in six months. Mm -hmm. So we started in January, January, end of February, and in July we issued the first uh, mobile ID certificate. And then you did see the graphs, how the usage rate went up. So, yes. uh, you know, the, the uh, implementation might take a few months, which is not that long, actually. But then also, uh, the more services you provide to the population, uh, you really, re really see the, the uptake uh, in that as well. Um, another good question that I saw. Uh, pop, 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 where was it? Yes. Um, this is actually, I think this is a small misunderstanding, but maybe you can elaborate on this. How does the police check a mobile ID, in brackets, NFC reader, question mark, and make sure that what is shown is not a screenshot? So it's more about control codes, like in Estonia, I would imagine, but maybe you yes. can um, explain the process. So exactly. to understand the mobile ID is not like... Uh, physical passport with uh, it's some not a picture. Yeah, yeah. photo mm -hmm. of picture and your name. It's a digital name that uh, I maybe already was said in this conference that in Estonia we have a personal ID code that everybody citizens knows. In Azerbaijan it is FIN code, basically the same, which is given by birth and uh, till the end of your life. So uh, police doesn't check this information. This information is checked by circulation authority when you would like to access e-service, not physical service, mm -hmm. but e-service. But yes, we have some uh, right now solutions that uh, will provide uh, physical uh, documents like ID card, uh, passport, driving license, uh, tran uh, public transport uh, tickets uh, that we uh, can, uh, the uh, police or controller can check physically. But it's in future. Yeah. Mostly mobile ID is for digital uh, services. Yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. Yeah, so this also answers, I think, the question whether mobile ID is recognized by foreign authorities in the absence of a visa. That's not quite no. what it is for. Yes. Yes. Uh, so it would be used in different circumstances. Um, is it possible to get mobile ID by non-residents of Azerbaijan? And how is it possible to use mobile ID by foreigners around the world? Yes, uh, so it's called, as I mentioned before, M-residency. It's very similar to Estonian e-residency. Uh, the uh, uh, difference are in Estonia we are offering ID cards, in Azerbaijan we are offering mobile ID cards, yeah. SIM cards. So uh, this can be, uh, you can uh, get this uh, mobile ID in uh, Azerbaijanian embassies. 
uh, the same as Estonia ID cards. And uh, after you receive, you can open your company digitally. It takes uh, approximately 20 to 30 minutes in, uh, that, uh, to open a company and to open a bank account. And from that, you can uh, start uh, your company and do all the digital transactions, all, use all digital services that mm -hmm. are connected to our infrastructure. Uh, last but not least, is the mobile ID um, uh, legally equivalent to a handwritten signature? Yes. Correct. Yeah. So, so that's the whole, the not, not the whole point, but <laughs> part of the point uh, of mobile ID that it replaces the physical need to, uh, exactly. especially during COVID-19, uh, to meet up in, in a location to print out documents to sign, maybe with the same pen even, uh, and, uh, and to then drive back to wherever you came from. So, so that's exactly what, what these different EID carriers are, are all about. Uh, well, um, Daniel, thank you so much for, for being with us. Um, it, was, it was great to have you answer a lot of different questions from you, the audience. And we're going to stick with you for just uh, another second. We have one final task for you. There is one more poll. Uh, namely, do you think there are limitations on where EIDs can work? Uh, either, yes, EID only works in Estonia. Uh, yes, EID can only work in democracies. Or no, EID can come in different forms and thus work for anyone, uh, regardless of, of the country in question. Uh, so you can give us your thoughts on this. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to introduce to you uh, Davi Kotka. He is the founder of Proud Engineers, and he's also the former chief information officer of the Republic of Estonia. And he will tell us more about how to solve the question, who is behind a device? Let's take a look. If you truly want to go digital, it's quite simple. The first one is telecommunication. There has to be enough internet everywhere, at least 30 megabits per second. If people cannot access stuff in their mobiles or at home with a normal speed, there is no trust towards the government and services. The second thing is that everybody has to have a digital name and it has to be recognized by private sector also, not only government sector. There has to be strong digital identity connected with that unique identifier so people actually could use the services behind mobile device or behind the computer. The third principle is that you have to put standards in place to make data exchange happen. Like there has to be motivation to exchange data between different institutions, also between government bodies and any private sector institution. Fourth is trust. People have to feel that their data is protected, their privacy is protected, People have to trust this whole digital ecosystem. The fifth principle is proper understanding of privacy and data protection. Being connected doesn't mean that you give away your privacy. The sixth principle is no legacy. And there has to be a rule that all like, major meaningful applications shouldn't be older than 13 years. And the seventh principle is you have to continuously amuse people. When people see some cool stuff, they start demanding it more. You have to provide them with totally new solutions, the new way of thinking. That tribe has to be in DNA of your employees. Hello, my name is Tavi Gotka. I'm a former chief information officer of Estonian government and today representing Proud Engineers and uh, Reliant Geo. Uh, as you saw, I mean, building digital society needs at least seven uh, crucial steps. And uh, like, obviously, the, having enough internet is, is the baseline. But the second best thing, or the second issue that needs to be solved is how we see our people, how we see our customers, how we see our citizens, patients, Etc. It's just funny that still, like globally, this problem is not solved. I mean, in most societies, in most countries, uh, government and the private sector sees a person in a different way, even though the attributes are the same, like the name, surname, uh, addresses, etc. So there are no unique identifiers that identify uh, those people for both sectors. Yes, there are social security IDs, there are patient IDs, there are different kind of IDs, but, but those 
IDs are mostly sector-based or discipline-based. For example, the social security ID can be used only in healthcare and for taxes, but not for banking, etc. Which means that it's basically like impossible to build like services in a way where like you get, take information from the private sector, let's say uh, tax declarations, and you carry that information to your like government declaration, and you pull information from different sources because John Smith in one system is not the same John Smith in other system. And governments have tried to solve this in many different ways. Like, for example, in Japan, they call it Mainama Project. Uh, like, one ID, like one unique identifier for all the citizens, but with a crucial mistake. With a mistake that it's secret number, it's not a public number. But if it's a, not the public number, then again, private sector cannot use it. Again, we cannot combine information from private sector with the government data. But how are we going to do AI? How are we going to do machine learning? How are we going to predict future if we can't use all the data sources? Um, there are way better examples, let's say, uh, from China, uh, also from North Europe, uh, Scandinavia, Baltics, uh, who actually have those capabilities. And there is one more like, beautiful example, which is India, uh, the Aadhaar project. So India started uh, more than 10 years ago to give uh, unique identifiers to their people like in return of the biometrics. And it was a successful pro project. The way that now you can identify a person allowed the government to spread uh, money in a way that uh, like a lot of corruption was removed and like a lot of people got out from the poetry. So, um, unique identifi identifiers are important. And also it's important to understand, like, uh, when you start building this digital society, who is actually behind device? But how to do that? Like, what is the identifier? How you authenticate yourself? So, today, large enterprises try to solve this by themselves. Like, we use Google IDs, we use Apple IDs, uh, we use Facebook IDs. But, um, I mean, the fact that the OTP worked and, and I got an email and I, I clicked that email, yeah, it's fun, but like, how can I be sure that behind the device is exactly that John Smith? So it's a struggle. And it's a question like how society should approach this. I mean, uh, we could say that, oh, it's everybody's problem. Like, uh, but if you start calculating, if it's everybody's problem, then Fintech needs to solve it, like telco needs to solve it, like marketplaces need to solve it, uh, government needs to solve it, healthcare need, needs to solve it, education needs to solve it. I mean, why it has to be so expensive? Like, can we actually create something that everybody will accept and use? And that's a key question. Like, uh, we have seen, for example, a remarkable example from Sweden, uh, where the banks actually took the initiative created something that everybody could use as a digital identity, and uh, the government was basically sleeping until they discovered that, hmm, it's so widely spread, everybody's using it, so why not to use it? Or let's take the example of Estonia, where private sector made an order uh, that like, uh, we should have like national digital identity, and then the government took the lead, Estonian police started to issue those, those identities, and voila, like we are here where we are at the moment, thanks to that. But there are not too many very positive examples of this kind of collaboration. Uh, but without having like private sector working together with the government, no digital society will happen. Why? I mean, like one thing is that like there has to be clear understanding like who issues those documents and like how you can say that now this is a unique ID and this is a digital identity that belongs to that person. Like, setting up all this is complicated. Um, Australia has tried twice, uh, both times failed. Uh, why? Because those kind of reforms take time and, like, parliament cycles are just four years and four years are not enough to make this change happen. So, um, here, like, even with Estonia, if you look at the screen, you can see, like, things didn't went as planned, like the blue line uh, represents uh, the actual usage of the digital identity, and the black line uh, represents like uh, 
how it was pushed the people. In Estonia, having a digital identity was mandatory. That's why the, like I say, the takeaway was good, but not with the services. Because in the beginning, you have that kind of chicken and egg problem. Like people don't want to use uh, like a new tool or new functionality if there are not enough services. And the service providers, they cannot see like why they should support new technology if there are not enough users. So making this decision in society that, oh, why don't we, in our country, agree between the private sector and the government that we will solve the question, who is behind the device? And we will solve it together like, like, as two sectors, where basically the government sector can start like represent the issuing part, and the private sector promises that they will actually deliver enough services that to motivate people to use it. Only then this might happen. And in, even then, if you have this agreement, um, you might expect what we call CIO nightmare, where there are not enough users or not, not enough services, and politicians and society will look at you and say, like, where is the money, Lebowski? So, Proud Engineer is a company like, who helps uh, like governments, CIOs, uh, societies to understand those changes and like, how to basically deal with them. What kind of legislation you need, what kind of people you need, what kind of organizations you need to build, uh, what processes need to be put in place, what technologies could be used, like how to set up the tenders, etc. So, uh, like, uh, if you need more information in those areas, we are definitely there to help. And obviously, like, this is all, like, if you put it in place, it's a cornerstone for your digital society to start actively exchange data between different data sources. And to make it even more challenging, uh, as you know, like Estonians can vote over the internet. We have done it since 2005. And we just like recently spoke with India that this could be the ultimate goal for the Indian government and Indian society. Yes, it takes like most probably a decade to reach that. But what if like especially in the time of pandemic, like like having an election in a way that you don't physically need to appear any polling station, etc. So that's the ultimate trust that you actually can reach with your national digital identity. And uh, like every country together, government and private sector should do that. And if you need any help, we are there to help you. And if you have any questions now or afterwards, we are also in the breakout sessions, like you can ask us directly. Thank you for having us. Thank you for keeping interest on Proud Engineers. Thank you. Uh, well, Tavi, thank you so much for, for being with us here on stage and also sharing that lovely photo of the team uh, at the end. Um, so we have plenty of questions that all received a similar number of uh, upvotes, so we'll, we'll go through them one by one. Uh, there are some very good ones indeed. But before we do, of course, we have uh, the final uh, task, the final poll results to look at. Uh, do you think there are limitations on where EIDs can work? And uh, it's, it's almost unanimous. Uh, people agree that yes, EID can come in different forms and work uh, around the world. I think that's a, a very fair assessment. EIDs are not limited to democracies, I, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like, uh, <coughs> uh, we have seen better results in societies where there is no democracy, <laughs> if, I say, if I can say so. Or if there is a democ democracy in China? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say limited democracy. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's uh, yeah. You can say many many things about authoritarian versus democratic states, uh, but if you have one person at the top who makes decisions and who can force them through today, then yes, some things can also be decided much faster and implemented faster. Uh, heading over to the questions from the audience, uh, the first one is: How do you foster the right attitude and spirit for a country who already has an EID and the, the responsible KPI or PKIs, uh, but that just don't know how to use it and transform it? to success so like where is the disconnect happening there uh, the connection is uh, or disconnection uh, happens where you don't have enough use cases uh, mm. like uh, people use only those tools that they need every day so if the digital ID can only be used let's say for government services then people don't use government services every day what they use every day is for example financial services if the financial sector doesn't allow you to, to use the same tools mm. like uh, and provide other tools there is already, this system is already broken. 
Yeah. So uh, basically, let's, you, you should start uh, from the fact that you fix the fact that big players, especially in finance sector and telecom, actually support your identity. Um, I, I believe one of the very first services that came online in Germany uh, was that you could, with your electronic uh, ID card, that you could renew your passport, uh, which of course we do every day because passports are only valid for a couple of days. Uh, so a very, very useful service uh, indeed. I like the sarcasm. Yeah, um, <laughs> no sarcasm dis detected here. Um, another question is, uh, and, and I think there... The answer has several layers, but doesn't creating universal electronic IDs also mean that you create one single point of failure? Uh, yes and no. I mean, uh, definitely uh, even Estonia has seen uh, downsides. I mean, uh, let's say if there is a threat uh, on your crypto that like, it might be hacked or, or compromised somehow, definitely uh, it will, like, uh, I'll say, uh, influence this. Mm. And that's why it's important that, uh, yes, you have some kind of core uh, identity, let's say that an Estonian engaged ID card that is issued uh, by the government, but in every day you actually have multiple different uh, authentication methods like yeah. smart ID, mobile ID, etc. So if one fails, like still other, other, other tools are working. Uh, so uh, having different options here is very important. Like. Uh, so it's not, as you said, it's, it has a, it's a question with different layers. But what is good about it that, <coughs> um, uh, for example, when you create a new portal or you come out with a new service, uh, it's very easy to onboard uh, new customers or, or like uh, new people because uh, you don't have to worry about uh, like uh, sign up thing or like uh, how, how I actually get the understanding who is actually talking with me. like. Yeah. Uh, in which level uh, of security I can provide services, like can I deal with money or not, like all those questions like can be easily removed and it's very, becomes very simple to create new digital services. Uh, also, I guess uh, at least we should we should talk about for just one second uh, something like the X road, uh, some sort of data exchange, meaning that there is not one super database where uh, if there is a failure with the electronic ID that uh, or the universal uh, personal code behind that, that all of the data is immediately accessible. So yes, even if uh, you would only have an electronic ID card and none of the other carriers, um, you could at least uh, divide all the different database responsibilities so that not everything is open all at once. So there are different measures uh, that you can take for sure. Um, what countries has Proud Engineers been active in? And do the hurdles, uh, this is interesting, uh, do the hurdles to digitalization differ from country to country? Uh, yes, it's absolutely true. The hurdles actually depend on, uh, uh, like, it also has a very, like, cultural uh, aspect. Um, I mean, as a consulting uh, like company or, or like, uh, like, giving opinions and, and uh, uh, charging, uh, like, uh, different countries, like, the list is more than 25. Mm. Uh, we have been more active with Japanese My Number. Uh, this is like I also want to point out as our failure because we, in the end of the day we were not capable to convince uh, the government uh, not to follow German uh, <laughs> model and look for the Scandinavian model. Yep. Uh, we are very active in, uh, in uh, Arabic countries, mm -hmm. uh, also in India uh, and obviously in Europe where we do most. Um, so, so the, the the different hurdles would be culture-based, political. How I would mean, you it's uh, in Anglo-Saxon countries there is a hurdle of privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there is a false understanding that uh, they think if it, if every silo collects data about you separately and deals with you separately, it protects your privacy more than than, than systems where everything is connected. Yeah. Uh, so that is in Canada, in US, in Australia, Germany, UK. Uh, and the list go, goes on. Uh, there are countries who don't actually who talk about digitalization, but actually don't want to go digital and start building those basic building blocks mm. because of corruption. Because yeah. like if uh, uh, society becomes more digital, there is less ways to to or say. It's a transparent society for everybody. Yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. Too much transparency, <laughs> like uh, and uh, yeah. if society are dependent on those uh, bribes, like then. Uh, the like, mechanisms, yeah. yeah. So you don't want to get rid of that. Uh, so, uh, like, there are a lot of societies where people actually cannot see the need, mm -hmm. and that's it's very important to define, like, uh, 
what can get better like if you actually do this? Like, what if private sector and government sector are capable to identify a person uh, in, a, in, in, in a one and only way? And what does, what good things it, it brings, brings to the society? And what kind of like, future service you can build on top of that? This is, an, in, many, in many cases, this is a, is, is a key problem. People actually cannot see the future. Mm. Uh, one last question, um, also because you mentioned uh, i-voting uh, in your presentation. In case of i-voting, how would the state know if the right citizen is voting at the uh, other end of the computer? Um, please, your explanation. I mean, like, uh, first of all, like, uh, in Estonia, we have a very good population registry, as everybody has a unique identifier. We actually know who has a voting right and who doesn't have a voting right. So it means that, like, if person, like, who has a voting right accesses our voting system uh, with secure digital identity, like uh, the system is clear that, okay, we can allow you in. And uh, like uh, how we know like that you are behind device is like the way how our identity is built up. So it's something you have and something you know. Mm. I mean, the identity has given to you and you only, and only you know the pins like uh, how to use it. So we can assume that behind the computer is you. I, I, what I what I like about this is also that because we only have one electronic identity at at the foundation, um, uh, it means that if you technically it would be possible for me to give you my ID card and my PIN codes, and then you could vote on my behalf. But of course, if I do that, I would also open the gate to every single other service uh, on my behalf. So you could also look into my healthcare records and everything else. I mean, I but actually would uh, most probably go to your bank account. That yeah, is so uh, it's, uh, at least equally I handy. I mean, if, I can, if you give me a chance to steal money instead of voting on your behalf, like... Yeah. Um, you would take I would take my think money first. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very safe bet. Um, so, so what I'm what I'm trying to say with this is because we have pooled all of this into one electronic uh, authentication method, effectively, um, um, we make it less likely that people would be willing to sell their vote or or anything like that because they would give access to the person for everything else. And very importantly, with online voting, you can change your vote afterwards as well. There's always a seven-day period where you can vote as many times as you want online and only the last vote counts. You want to Yeah, that's the point. I yeah. mean, like, buying or selling votes doesn't... Doesn't like really help. work in Estonia. Yeah. Uh, but... One correction, like there are actually multiple ways how to authentication log methods. Yeah. Yes, so yes, it's not the only one. I misspoke. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Davi, thank you so much for for being with us today. Um, time for a small summary from from my side. Uh, I, I think the, what we've seen here um, during the last few presentations, uh, there are several things. Uh, number one, uh, yes, what's going on in Estonia is wonderful to see. But number two, much more importantly, it can work in other countries as well. Not necessary as a copy paste solution, uh, but instead uh, with regards to to the cultural. Uh, context in a particular country with regards to uh, also the, the legal environment, the legal frameworks that have to be taken into account. So all of these things can, can certainly be done and Estonian companies have done that uh, around the world uh, already. Um, equally importantly, uh, I would say paper-based uh, paper identities do not mean that you have privacy. Conversely, having an electronic identity does not mean a big brother state. Um, digitalization is a tool and it depends on the politicians in a given country how they want to implement it, how they want to use it. So um, yes, digitalization can very much be used for good uh, to create more transparency and a more accountable system uh, of government as well. Now, um, you've gone through these presentations and I hope that you found them very interesting, but there are other things as well that we are now focusing on and they're very, very interesting uh, indeed. We will soon head to the breakout sessions with the three different companies, with SKID Solutions, with Best Solutions and with Proud Engineers. But before we do that, just a couple of kind reminders. Number one, many of you have asked, uh, what happens uh, to, to this show? Can I, can I see the recording at any time? Uh, yes, you can. We will send out the recording via email to everybody who has registered. Uh, number two on the agenda is uh, that I would like to make you aware of our next digital discussion, which will be about the field of mobility uh, and what Estonia and Estonian companies have done in that field. Last but not least, 
I mentioned that many different companies have been creating these solutions uh, commissioned by the Estonian government. And the question that we often get is, uh, if we think about a particular service in Estonia, which company actually made this particular service? Uh, we have now created a digital expo that you can also access online, and we have a small introductory video that will tell you more about how that works. Uh, from my side, uh, it's, a, it's a big thank you for your attention, for your participation with all the questions and polls. Um, please stay safe and also have fun with the three companies in the breakout rooms. I wish you a wonderful wonderful day. Stay safe, healthy, and have a good time. Thank you, and bye-bye.